Live from South Florida, the Brian Mudd Show starts right now. Now, now. News Radio 610 WIOD. On the days they're getting their treatment, those days are very important for them to do their small frequent meals every two to three hours. uh, Because really the worst thing for nausea is an empty stomach is the sound of Layla Silverman, and she is uh, from Memorial Healthcare. She's an oncologist and a dietitian, and uh, we appreciate her also taking the time with us right now live to discuss the role that nutrition plays in cancer treatment. So um, last hour, we ended up discussing a study out of Belgium. Scientists came forward with this last week and showed that sugar can exacerbate cancer risk. And we talked to an oncologist who wrote a book about sugar's role in uh, increasing cancer risk. And he agreed with the the Belgian researchers. And he has some, I think, pretty good takeaways uh, where he was talking about the uh, quantity of grams of sugar to have at any given time. He said if you go above three grams, you can begin to to cause uh, some of the ebb and flows and energy and crashing and then some of the dependency on sugar. And he also ended up saying that, you know, if you're really trying to figure out if you are increasing your overall cancer risk, just take a look at your waistline. And, uh, you know, if you have issues with, with your waistline, which you're probably well aware of, you're probably increasing your overall cancer risk. And I thought those kind of common sense takeaways uh, were helpful and interesting. And I'd love to get your thoughts and your takeaways uh, because certainly improving our health is something that many of us are desirous of doing but often struggle doing. Uh, So, Layla, thank you for taking the time with us this morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you bet. So, you know, first your thoughts about that overall uh, sugar study and and its role in in exacerbating cancer. So what I try to explain to patients every day about um, the sugar and cancer is to cut back on added sugars because there's a lot of natural sugars in a lot of healthy foods that that they should be incorporating into their diet, like fruits and and low-fat dairy. But added sugars are the ones that we try to focus on cutting back. Um, So, you know, making sure they're adding less to their coffee, um, all the concentrated sweets like cookies, cakes, pies, candy, those things are the ones they, they really need to cut back on. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that because once you start cutting down or cutting out adding things, it's amazing how much less of whatever it is you feel like you need. I used to add salt and pepper to everything that could have it. Mm-hmm. And my one change for 2017, um, after my health assessment earlier this year, I cut out adding salt to anything. And uh, the result, I anytime I have something that's really salty, it's like, it jumps out and and it's too much. My my go to snack uh, used to be like a, a bag of Cheez Its. I can't even eat those anymore because of how salty they seem. A lot of times people will think that oh you know I'm not going to like the same food or whatever if I don't you know add the the same amount in this case sugar or whatever. But really your body adjusts to that uh, pretty quickly, doesn't it? Yeah, your taste buds do adjust, and like you said, you know things now taste too salty if they have too much salt. So same thing with sugar. If you're used to adding, you know, five teaspoons and you start cutting back and cutting back, once you uh, try having something that's really, really sweet, you're going to say, oh, that's really, really sweet for me. I don't like it anymore. So when it comes to nutrition, I'm sure you see this pretty much daily. Um, what it, what appears to work for most people is something that they can do that's part of their lifestyle that doesn't make them feel like they're sacrificing. Uh, and often why, you know, it appears that many diets fail, that they're, uh, you know, set up to help people lose weight, but it's not necessarily something they can do in perpetuity. So with that in mind, um, you know, how do people deal with their overall specific health needs, maybe in some cases look to lose weight, uh, but be able to do so in a way that is helpful and consistent over the longer run? So it has to be a lifestyle change. We believe, you know, you have to incorporate those healthy eating recommendations into your daily life um, by making it simple and making it fit into your daily routine. And that's what we try to do with cancer patients as well. Here at Memorial, uh, we try to develop a care plan for nutrition that fits into their current lives and helps them throughout their cancer journey. 
How long does somebody have to stay on a plan before it becomes part of what they do in second nature? Um, you know, it depends on, on every person. We get patients that uh, are, you know, are, are very, um, they're going through trauma, basically, because of their diagnoses. And so they want to do everything they can uh, to make those changes and help themselves, because this is one of the things they have control of, nutrition, what they put in their mouth. So um, people sometimes start making changes right away, and then others, you know, it depends. Maybe there's too many things going on in their lives, and nutrition is just one small piece, and eventually they'll get to that. But, uh, you know, it's different for every patient, so it's very individualized. You know, you bring up uh, an important point there. A lot of things going on in somebody's life. We know that uh, the go-to emotionally for comfort for a lot of people, food. And Mm -hmm. do we see that part of the reason why many people struggle to stay on a plan is uh, related to, you know, maybe the rest of the emotional whatever it is that they're dealing with in their lives? Yeah, you know, the mental health is, is plays a big role. And so if they're going through a lot or they have a lot of anxiety, all of that gets in the way of making the changes they need to make. Um, but there's ways to go around that. And, and, you know, it's never impossible. So we have here at Memorial, we also have uh, psychology for our patients. So, you know, if we're trying to make them changes in their diet and they are also going to see our psychologist, uh, we can work together to help them make those changes. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, I, I see it all the time with money. My first rule of money is never to let your money and emotions cross paths. But we do, uh, you know, a lot of things emotionally. And uh, the intake for so many people to go to during times of stress, you know, they, we call it comfort food for a reason. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's awfully important. You know, going forward with, like, the research we were talking about out of Belgium last week and, you know, uh, just the the plethora of of research studies going on, many of which I'm, I'm sure will provide even more beneficial information. How likely do you think it is in the not-so-distant future to really have very custom, specific to us approaches to overall cancer treatment, to lifestyle fixes that might be more successful than just the general guidance given a diagnosis? Um, you mean like specific to nutrition? That's so- right. So there are some things out there now where they can check, you know, it's nutrigenomics, it's called. And so they can check and see what people are most at risk of, you know, and kind of change your diet based on that, anticipating that you are going to develop X, Y, and Z disease. Um, I, I don't know that it's, it's, you know, they've done enough research to make a recommendation or, but um, overall, Making lifestyle changes, eating better, staying uh, more active is going to help you in your overall health. Okay. Uh, prevent, you know, many, many different diseases. So, and that's, you know, those are two things we have control of. Yeah, it know? makes sense. And, and the reason I wanted to ask you about it, and it sounds like, you know, the, the jury's a little uh, still out on, on some of that newer research. If we could come back, you know, if we could take a test and, uh, you know, you, you, folks at Memorial, for example, could say, all right. You've got a 45% chance of developing this particular malady, and here are your increased risk factors. Well, if you're telling that to me, I'm going, all right, what are those increased risk factors? Let's do everything we can to cut those out and really kind of focus preventatively on things that could exacerbate risk. And so I'm really interested in that type of, of research and information on the preventative side going forward. Uh, so, you know, do you think that we're we're making headway there? And is that something that, you know, you, you believe could end up changing in the not so distant? I think we are making headway. You know, there's a lot of new, new research about nutrition. Almost every day, recommendations change. Um, and, and, but overall, nutrition is, is preventative medicine, really. And so whatever you can do to eat better, you know, uh, exercise more, all of that is going to help you at the end of the, you know, the road. So um, lifestyle changes is the key. That's an awesome takeaway. That is a really great line. Nutrition is preventative medicine. Uh, That's uh, good stuff. I appreciate it. Thank you for the uh, time and for the information. Thank you for having us. Yeah, you bet. Uh, That is Layla Silverman. Uh, She's with Memorial Healthcare, an oncology dietitian.